Welcome to the City Manager's Report. The City Manager's Report, a look at city updates and municipal news. And a preview of the next Oshkosh Common Council meeting agenda. Your hosts, Emily Makowski of Oshkosh Media and Assistant City Manager, John Fitzpatrick. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the City Manager's Report. I'm John Urban, sitting in for Emily Makowski. And as the introduction said, we have John Fitzpatrick, Assistant City Manager, sitting in for City Manager Mark Roloff. On today's program, we're going to be talking about some of the highlights for the upcoming Tuesday, September 27th, Oshkosh Common Council meeting. That meeting will be seen live, as always, on GovTV, live at 6 o'clock. Also be on uh, simulcast live on the radio on Oshkosh FM 101.9. And also be seen live on the web on oshkoshmedia.org. So please take the opportunity to tune into any one of those sources to see the meeting live next Tuesday, September 27th at 6 p.m. So, John, as always, we're going to be talking about some of the highlights for the upcoming council agenda, as we talked about. But, however, we do like to spend a few minutes talking about some of the other activities happening in and around the city of Oshkosh. And uh, one of the things we want to talk about is the um, Live Green event that was just recently going on. Right. So maybe you can kind of give us a little highlight of what, what all happened with that event. Sure, sure. I'd be happy to. Actually, um, this was really a, a bringing together the community to talk about sustainability issues and be exposed to more um, practices that might be um, available to them. We, uh, you can see by some of the video there that we have uh, um, a variety of different um, vendors, not only vendors, but also um, sources of uh, um, community outreach, yes, yep. that people can contact and, and try to get information from. Um, for example, one of the one of the more popular displays was uh, a rain barrel as an option to collect water, and you see a little bit of that right there. Um, in terms of how to work on it together as a family, how to conserve water and energy, how to maybe um, receive some credit as it relates to any kind of stormwater charges that a citizen might have. So it was a real good educational initiative uh, for the entire family. All right, good to see. Another item we want to talk about, um, I think people are liking to see the uh, progress that's happening down at the old Buckstaff property. Anyone that's driven by there recently may have noticed that uh, some of the buildings are coming down now, but there's a long way to go. It is very exciting. And I think um, it's one of the most popular things that, uh, questions that I receive in regard to uh, what's going on with the Buckstaff property. I know that folks are very excited about the idea, and so are we, that it's going to be coming down. and it's going to open up a whole world of possibilities for South Shore redevelopment. We've, um, um, not surprisingly, we've had a lot of people express interest in some um, interesting development opportunities on that side of the river there. So the fact that it's coming down and it's going to take a little while, we ask for people's patience because um, that building's been there for a long time. There's a lot of uh, material that's in the building and also as part of the connectivity with the with the foundation area so we have to take our time carefully and make sure that it's going to be removed safely but it's very exciting to have those areas become a, a blank canvas for us on the south side of uh, the community. I'm sure we'll be talking about that uh, as the months go by here. Okay uh, early voting is something the city clerks wanted us to remind people about how to do that that's obviously going to be a big uh, big discussion item as the elections come around this November. Right. So they've, gave, they've given us some uh, information they wanted us to share with the public in terms of how to go about doing that and some of the tips and uh, pointers that they wanted us to remind folks about. Right. We, uh, we expect that it's going to be a high turnout. Uh, we've had a lot of inquiries in regard to absentee voting. and um, It begins on October 24th, and the early voting is going to take place at the Oshkosh Convention Center. You can stop down there from 8 in the morning to 4.30 uh, in the afternoon. And then also uh, early voting can also take place at City Hall from 8, 8 to 4.30 on November 4th. Um, I mentioned to you, I think, earlier that we've had inquiries as far away as Australia. And that is a neat, a neat story. Why don't you share with us how, how that worked out? You had well, a gentleman called from Australia that used to live in the city of Australia? Actually, had somebody send me an email. Okay. And um, not that I have a lot of friends in Australia, but <laughs> this person happened to reach out to me and say, yeah, I used to live in the city of Oshkosh, I now work and live in Australia. 
I'd like to have the opportunity to vote in the election because I'm a, a U.S. citizen. How could I do that? So we sent that, I sent that on to our expert, uh, Pam Ubrig, and uh, her and her staff were able to resolve that issue and provide him an opportunity to vote in, in this year's election. So, Very neat. so that was pretty exciting. So a couple of the reminders as it relates to early voting that the, uh, that the clerk's office wanted us to remind folks is to very much bring a photo ID for the early voting and on the polls on election day. And also, uh, if you need to register to vote, please check the website for the acceptable proof of residence to do that. So those are two reminders from the city clerk's office coming up for the uh, November elections. Um, John, recently at the last council meeting on September 13th, they uh, approved the rental registry program. A um, little bit of a, a discussion on that, no doubt. There's a, been a lot of talk about this. What are the next steps in that process, and what can we expect moving forward? Well, right now I know community development is working on some checklists, some uh, health and safety inspection checklists. That's, that's going to be a major focus. They need to develop a fee schedule um, and locations for the 2017 inspections proposed. And... Um, the other element that's going to be important is we're going to be establishing a rental housing advisory board. So we'd like to uh, see a lot of interest expressed in the opportunity for people to participate. Um, if they're interested, they, they can call 236-5002 and talk to Diane Moran. She's the administrative assistant that works with City Manager Roloff, and she'd be happy to walk anybody who has interest uh, through the application process. Or they can of course, go to our website and there's instructions provided there as well. So again, 236-5002 if you're interested in serving on the Housing Advisory Board. Good opportunity to get involved. We also have a page, I believe, uh, there you go, thank you guys, to uh, kind of always encourage citizens to participate with their local government. And if you'd like to participate serving on a City Board, Commission, Committee, or Authority, please uh, fill out one of these applications. Uh, they generally always have an opening uh, on, on any one of these boards. We do encourage people to get involved. You can do that on the website www.oshkosh.wi.us or you can call the city manager's office, Diane, at 236-5002. Okay, um, there's a couple of seasonal things coming up that some of the departments said, hey, if you could give us a little plug, we'd appreciate mm -hmm. it. I know there's a couple coming up at the Oshkosh Public Museum. Right. A couple of events. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Night Whispers is one uh, program that's being uh, brought forward, and that's guided tours of um, the Oshkosh Public Museum, and um, people have expressed a lot of interest in this. Um, you know, there's always a lot of stories, old stories, about the idea that the museum may be haunted, there may be ghosts there, I can't confirm or deny that, but uh, I think in order to uh, gain more information, I'd encourage people to sign up for those for that and program. I, and I understand from Brad Larson, uh, the museum director, that this always sells out very quickly, these, these sessions, and people should should act quickly? It, uh, it does, and there's also a, a lecture that uh, focuses on the paranormal. That's part of this program itself. So um, it's very interesting, and I would encourage people to check it out if they haven't already. And they can do that by going to the uh, museum website, oshkoshmuseum.org, yes. to do that. Okay. Yes. Another item you wanted to talk about uh, was, um, I think, another item for Zuluween Boo, correct? Right, Zuluween Boo, and uh, that's going to be... Um, a program that's a very successful program that's taken place uh, also um, right around this time of year and it's put on by the Ashkash Parks Department and we're fortunate to have Festival Foods is also a partner in that program. It's going to take place in Menominee Park on the 15th and 16th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. So hopefully uh, you may want to get out and um, Get your tickets ahead of time. Get your tickets Advanced ahead tickets, of time. You can call Jenny at 236-5089, 236-5089, or again, uh, her email there, jmccolian at ci.oshkosh.wi.us. It's a really nice family uh, program that they have set up for that. Now, know. another event that's uh, more adult-focused uh, is the Monster Bash. That's coming up as well. Right, and the proceeds from that uh, program is, are going to go to the Oshkosh Zoo Society. But you're right, it is another event that's going to include a costume contest, raffles, a silent auction, um, adult trick-or-treating stations. I can't get into all the specifics associated with that, but I don't know if you want to talk about that, John. I don't, I don't have any information about the adult trick-or-treating. It, well, sounds, it sounds like fun, though. I think maybe it's best left that way in order to we'll encourage people out. to check it out. There Absolutely. You go. 
All right, well, that's kind of a recap of some of the events and activities happening around the city of Oshkosh. We're now uh, going to take a short break, but when we return, we're going to come back and talk about some of the highlights of the upcoming Tuesday, September 27th, Oshkosh Common Council meeting. Stay tuned. We'll be back with more of the city manager's report right after this. in Mexico. I, I'm in jail. Jimmy, is that you? Yeah, it's Jimmy. I need money for bail right now. In jail? You need to send money right now. Please don't tell anyone. Scammers are tricky and can pretend to be anybody in any situation. They seem like the real deal. They play on your fears. The goal? To get you to act fast. Check out if they really are who they say they are, even if they sound like a loved one. Heard from an imposter? Report it at ftc.gov slash imposters. It is sad but true that for years, some people have been using storm drains to dispose of their wastes. Sanitary sewers take waste from bathrooms and kitchens and clean them up. But storm sewers do not treat or clean up anything passing through them. Everything that enters a storm drainage system is eventually discharged into a stream, river, lake, or bay in exactly the same form as it entered. One of the responsibilities of municipalities that operate storm sewer systems is to prevent what the EPA calls illicit discharges. Illicit discharges are any discharges of non-storm water into or through the storm sewer. When illicit discharges enter surface waters, they can kill wildlife. They can suffocate plants and fish, destroy breeding and nesting areas. Never pour or dump anything down any storm drain. Hi there, everyone. Welcome back to the City Manager's Report. I'm John Urban, sitting in for Emily Makowski. Joining me for the City Manager's Report is the Assistant City Manager, John Fitzpatrick, sitting in for City Manager Mark Roloff. John, uh, before we got uh, into, after we got on the break now, we're going to be talking about the agenda items, some of the highlights of the agenda items for the Tuesday, September 27th Common Council meeting. And one of the items we want to talk about, um, again, we try to focus on things that are of, of more public interest than maybe perhaps some others, Number six and uh, number six is about a uh, proof of purchase of a vacant lot on the 600 block of Jefferson Street. We have a map that kind of shows where this area roughly is. W what do you right. know about this particular item? Well, actually, this is an area that I think um, used to ho house the uh, the public gardens and still does the community gardens. And um, we have a, a developer that's interested in developing this entire area um, and putting in some multifamily units possibly 14 to 16 units that I believe are going to be um, a little more upscale in terms of what they might be able to provide to the community. And this is an area um, uh, of the community that has some older homes and we haven't had a lot of interest in, in um, developing these, these vacant lots for, for quite some time. So it's, it's very exciting to have this interest be generated I know City Manager Roloff has talked on previous meetings about the interest in housing in the downtown central city area. And in order to revive a central city area, it's very important to have people living and working and shopping in that area rather than relying on people coming in and commuting. Mm -hmm. So this is just another opportunity for us to, to kind of validate that theory by having people live downtown. All right. Uh, the next two items we wanted to talk about, items number seven and eight, resolution 16468 and 16469 are, are really in the same area, which is approve the land disposition of vacant lot to discover properties on Dawes Street, 211, formerly 211 Dawes Street, and then 510 Campus Place. We have a map as well of this particular area, and, mm -hmm. and is this, this is a, around a, a current subway? It is. It is. It's, it's the subway that's not too far away from, um, from the Wisconsin Street area. Mm -hmm. And actually, the idea behind this is to, uh, to develop those areas 
and have some infill projects that are related to student housing. So as I mentioned, um, I think there's really been a conscious effort of developers recently to, to seek out and develop some of the properties that exist in the downtown area and I think that is really a result of some of the careful planning that's taken place not only by community development but also the, some of the plans have been implemented by the Common so Council. We're starting to realize some of the private investment now after the public Absolutely. Investment. Okay. Absolutely. Exciting. Another item we wanted to talk about, Resolution 16470, which is item number nine, approved settlement agreement with Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources pertaining to the pollution discharge elimination system permit. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what that all means, but it sounds like we got a good agreement. We do. We do, and uh, the, we work with the DNR frequently. Uh, we partner with them on a lot of projects. This happens to be more of a, a clean water project, and um, we were able to resolve an issue and we held others in abeyance in order for us to move forward. So I think it's a good agreement for the city and it, it provides an opportunity for us to move forward um, and be in concert with um, you know, some of the safety measures that we both want to have in place. So. Okay. Resolution 16473, item 12, approve a change order to interclean equipment for an undercarriage wash component for the Public Works Field Operations Facility auto wash system. This is something I know in our area of purchasing, we've been working a lot with in getting the initial auto wash system installed there. Mm -hmm. We do have some pictures to kind of give people an idea of where this all is, but it's basically a, a car wash, if you will, inside the, inside the field operations facility that wasn't built in the initial part, but the framework was, in, was installed in anticipation of, of installing this auto wash system at, at a later time. Exactly, and it is an important component of, uh, of the field operations facility. We have a uh, tremendous investment in all kinds of different vehicles, um, traditional and non-traditional vehicles that we use. And um, if people may or may not know with our previous field operations facility, it was so small and undersized, we had difficulty storing vehicles even inside and protecting them from the elements. So that adding the field operations facility was one component of that, in addition to making it much more easy to do their jobs and a variety of other things. But another component, is having the ability to keep those vehicles clean and serviced appropriately so they have a longer life. Um, that auto wash facility not only will clean the exterior but also the undercarriage and you know in our climate with the snow and a lot of the salt associated with the work that some of the folks do at the field operations facility that's really going to help us preserve and save some tax dollars um, as we move forward. And the way this all went down, the auto wash system was actually approved by council back in, at their June meeting. This is now a change order to add on this undercarriage component, Correct. which uh, is projected to save another $6,000 a year in utility savings because then riders can, the drivers can choose, do they need the whole full body wash or just the undercarriage? Right. And by doing that, there's some uh, some savings that are going to be realized from the uh, water and uh, utilities associated with that. So Absolutely. That's, that's a good... Uh, a good component to add on. All right, uh, we also want to talk about, and it's hard to believe this is right around the corner, but it, it, this is the way it moves quick these days. The uh, Celebration of Lights is uh, coming up, and uh, there's a, an item on the agenda, Resolution 16474, number 13, to approve the uh, their special event to utilize Menominee Park for the Celebration of Lights. And so if, if you're new to the community, it's it's something they've never seen before, they got to check it out. Oh, it's fantastic. It's something that I believe former Parks Director Tom Stefani was instrumental in uh, developing for the community and um, it's really started out as an idea and has just become a labor of love for many, many people in the community. We have people that come from long distances actually to see this event and oftentimes it's coupled with the ability for people to um, provide food items to an open pantry. There are a variety of, uh, I believe, what they consider to be free nights, mm -hmm. community or, nights. or reduced nights where right. if you bring a some sort of uh, canned good or some food item that can be do donated to the Ashkesh Food Pantry, um, you can uh, see this uh, display for for a reduced or even a free, free cost. We don't have in front of us the full detail of what's happening this year, but I know in years past they've had Santa's workshop, they've got opportunities where you can come in and get some goodies with the kids and so forth. Right. So as you can see, they got reindeer there. They have in the past. We assume most of this will carry over this year, but it's a, it's a really neat opportunity. Bring your kids, bring your family. If you got family coming in or relatives coming in for the this period of time, and it runs a long time. It does, and I, I would also add, I think there's there's holiday music, 
if it's if it's possible for you to roll your window down a little bit and listen um, I think there might also be some, some simulcast opportunity but um, but yeah it's just a very very nice family uh, event for people to take in neat thing to check out even though it's hard to see snow on the ground right now so it let's is. keep that away it is okay another item a couple items we want to talk about are under new resolutions uh, resolution 16 478 number 17 Approve agreement with Go HNI, which stands for Healthy Neighborhoods Incorporated, and Verve Credit Union. Um, do you have some information as to what this all means and, and, and what it really entails? I do. It is, um, it is a way for us to um, provide uh, monies, uh, and actually Verve and Go HNI, for them to help uh, provide monies that might be possible to uh, rehab acquire and rehab different projects in the community. So this uh, Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative is partnered with Verve and what the city is doing here is just collateralizing loans that may be provided by Verve in order to facilitate this. So it's something that I think um, is a way for us to help facilitate it um, and sometimes it's our responsibility to help um, provide opportunities and that's what this really is. Okay. So it's uh, I think a good foundational piece in order to continue that momentum of um, our development initiatives that we talked about earlier. Sounds like a neat program. Yes. All right, uh, the last item under new resolutions, resolution 16479 number 18, I know this is near and dear to your heart, approve the 2017-2018 strategic plan. Um, maybe we could back up and, and have you just kind of give us some background of when did when did we undertake putting together a strategic plan and how important is a strategic plan for an organization oh, I think it's it's vitally important I think it's important especially and has been important in the last several cycles our strategic plans typically run for a two-year cycle so I think this is probably maybe the fourth iteration of our strategic plan we started with baby steps just getting going and it's really evolved now to a pretty fully functional plan with some f significant metrics, some sig significant dashboards where people can monitor what's actually taking place. And um, there's, I know we have some graphics that kind of talk about the different components sure. of our plan. There's, and how the, ma broken there's down. the major focus areas this year. Right, so you can see that um, economic development is one major thrust of the, of the organization. Improving, developing, maintaining our infrastructure, strengthening our neighborhoods improving, maintaining our quality of life, and then um, also addressing public safety and health. And um, all those things in, con in co conjunction, you know, help uh, provide uh, a more effective government. And also, the more effective our government can be, not only from a support perspective, but also from a holistic perspective, we can more efficiently achieve those external uh, elements that we talked about. Well, maybe you could walk us through some of the timelines and some of the, the processes involved in putting together the, the strategic plan. I, I imagine this doesn't just happen in a matter of weeks. This is a, a long process, correct? It is, and we, we're fortunate. We have a consultant that helps facilitate our dialogue and also some of the components that take place when we go through our strategic planning, but um, we use a variety of sources of information. One of them would be our citizen survey. We take a look at what citizens have indicated uh, what they think we ought to be doing and how we're doing. And then we also kind of break down our organization in different components and then perform a similar analysis whereby we take a look at what the initiatives are, we rank them, and then we also rate them so we can see how we're doing in comparison with what are our highest priorities and then how are we performing. And by doing that, we create what's called a gap analysis. So we take a look at their priority and also our performance. And then those areas that have the largest gaps, in other words, high priority, but maybe we're not doing as good a job with them, that helps us um, move forward and prioritize them as, as the plan evolves and as we move forward. And I guess I would also say, you know, we talked about some of the past plans. Um, this plan wouldn't have been possible without all the work of previous councils and staff members. And um, it really was very, very important as we were going through the economic downturn to use this as kind of a roadmap, not only programmatically, but I know the council also 
were able to focus their attention budgetarily on some of these things that we were able to um, um, accomplish. An example of that, just one quick one would be um, when we had all kinds of vacant land available on the waterfront, even though it was an economic downturn, we were able to secure grants and secure some of that property. So now that the economy has moved forward, we have the opportunity to capitalize on that. So that's just one example of how this plan has helped facilitate and set up future opportunities for the community. I'm kind of throwing you a curveball, but let me just throw this to you. What, what have you learned from this process that surprised you over the last several years of working on these strategic plans? I mean, did you come, as it's gone along, have you, have you been surprised by certain things that you didn't anticipate or expect through the, through the process? Well, one thing that I think I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised about is just when you're working on a plan of this nature and when you're involving a variety of different organizational components, it really opens up the lines of communication it really creates some goal congruency. So uh, this year we more formally involved the supervisors in the process before it was the community, the council, the department heads. But in order to make sure that the entire organization is pulling in the same direction, you know, it needs to be interwoven with the entire organization all the way down to the employee level. So when they're working on their performance evaluations with their soup and we're talking about different goals, you know, they understand why we're doing what we're doing. They understand why the monies were devoted to those individual projects. And, and then I think when those things are realized and achieved, it just creates more, um, uh, I guess, satisfaction in terms of the achievement. I was going to say, I think we have more unified approach towards everything. We're all on the same page. A I bit think so, and I know you've been that. involved in it yep. too. So. Yep. I think it's been very helpful. All right, uh, we've only got about a minute or so left here, so I just kind of want to recap some of the upcoming budget workshops and some other items that the public should be aware of so that they can participate with it. So we're going to talk first about the uh, Municipal Court. There's a workshop coming up on that, and uh, that's coming up on October 11th at 5 p.m. So we want to get people to participate with that, John. And just very quickly, what, what is the Municipal Court workshop is about? That was an idea that the council wanted a city manager roll off to explore the possibility of us possibly having a, a separate municipal court to deal with some uh, ordinance violations, traffic citations, um, inspection related activity, that sort of thing. Okay, um, the next thing we're going to talk about is the all day budget workshops coming up October 17th and 18th from 8 till 4.30. Those are, those are the individual budget workshops with each individual department. These are all live on GovTV. Right. And the last item we want to talk about is the budget workshop coming up on November 2nd from 5 until 7 p.m. So again, a great opportunity to find out what's being planned for next year in terms of the city budgets, the municipal court, and more. We're going to be wrapping up this show now. Uh, again, we're talking about agenda items coming up on the Tuesday, September 27th, Oshkosh Common Council meeting agenda. It's going to be seen live at 6 p.m. on GovTV, Oshkosh FM 101.9, and of course, a simulcast live on our website, oshkoshmedia.org. For City Manager, I'm sorry, for Assistant City Manager John Fitzpatrick, I'm John Urban. Thanks for watching this edition of the City Manager's Report.